Hi there, and welcome to the Sunshine Readers Book Club. I'm Mr. Jonathan at the Hart Memorial Library, and today we're talking about Strongheart, Wonder Dog of the Silver Screen by Candace Fleming. Every two weeks, we're tackling a new book from the Sunshine State Readers 2020 and 2021 reading list for grades three through five. And I really enjoyed this book. It's about a German Shepherd named Etzel, who at first grows up to be a police dog, and he's very vicious because he is abused. But then he is adopted by a director of silent films named Larry. And from there, Larry turns him into a famous movie star. And Etzel is named Strongheart. And from there, there's all kinds of different things that happen to him. He meets a girl dog and then he gets into a debacle where he's accused of attacking a little girl and it's a fantastic read and today we're going to be doing activities all related to this read so come along with us <laughs> It's me, Gigi, and my pal, Super Zeus, training with treats. I don't endorse any one product. These are the things that work for us. Kibble for breakfast, dinner, and as a treat. Natural turkey dogs, no added nitrates or hormones. I chop it up real tiny and put it in the treat bag. And tiny little chicken liver treats. Go ahead and experiment. Try things like carrot sticks, cooked chicken, or peanut butter treats. See what works for you and your canine co-star. When we're performing at the libraries, a lot of the kids and the grown-ups too, they ask us how we put our act together. And the truth is, Zeus is my very first pet ever. I took out a lot of books at the library and I have found that this one was super informative and helpful. 101 Dog Tricks by Kira Sundance. Over time, we discovered that it's about the three P's, positive reinforcement, pooch treats, playtime, and petting. Zeus loves to be pet behind the ears. Isn't that true, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Club members at Osceola County Library. My name is Gigi and this is Zeus, also known as Super Zeus. We're at the park today and we always start our practice the same way. I'm gonna let you guys in on a few of our tips, uh, secrets, tricks, in case you want to learn how to train your dog. You guys ready? Zeus, I know you're ready. He's all about treats. Figure out what it is that your dog likes. My dog, he loves turkey treats, chicken liver treats. Look at this. He'll do just about anything for a treat. Isn't that right, Zeus? All right. So I'm going to open up the mat. We're already filthy. It's really sandy here at the park. Oh my goodness. Look at you. <laughs> All right. Here we go. We're going to start with sit. I use a verbal cue and a hand cue. You figure out what works for you. And remember, you really don't need to put a lot of time into it. We came to the dog park this morning and we're just gonna practice for about 10 minutes. So make sure your verbal cue and your hand cue is always the same for each trick that you're doing. So for the sit command, I like to do this for down. Down. Yes. Good job. Roll. Ah, good work, Zeus. You are filthy. Woo! <laughs> All right, I have one very dirty dog. <laughs> let's get a little warm up in. What do you think, Zeus? All right, let's do this. Come on, let's go.
turkey treats. So now we're gonna show you how we do some of those tricks. We'll break it down for you so you can do it at home with your favorite four-legged pooch. I have a verbal cue and I also have a cue with my hand. Zeus, push. Yes. Good work. You see, he just got the reward. There was a turkey treat in the mat and I just gave him another treat too. And when he does a trick, I try to give him one word of praise. My word is usually yes. So pick a word that you like. Do that about 10 times and then you won't even need the treat in the mat anymore. You'll just give them the treat after they open up the mat. Already know dogs have a great sense of smell. Now this next trick, the walkthrough, is a favorite of mine. Audiences love it and you can do this at home. It only takes a few minutes to practice this and you'll get this in just a day or two. I have a treat in each hand. Now Zeus is going to follow my hands because he knows I have a treat in them. Even if he doesn't see it, he can smell it. All right, check it out. Right, yes, left, right, left, right. Good boy, there you go. You get both of them, nice work. Audiences love this trick, and this is an easy one. It just takes a few days to practice this one. Yes. Good boy. Yeah. Ta-da! Here is what you do. Sit. See how I'm putting it right on the ground, and I have a treat right here? So it made it easy for him to just walk with it on the ground. And then you can graduate and gradually go a little bit higher. Jump. Good. Yeah, and then higher. Jump. Yeah, good job. We like to take things in baby steps, just like, you know, when you're teaching a baby. First they have to crawl, then they walk, and then they run. So we take it in baby steps, right, Zeus? So figure out what works for you and always use the same verbal and hand cues for each of your tricks. Here's one of my favorites. We really like to do the turning trick. Check it out. Here we go, turn, oh. turn, turn, yeah! Good work! That's my Zeus. <laughs> Good job, he loves his treats. Hey, thanks so much for watching, Sunshine Club members. Mwah. Good job, give me five, yeah! And don't forget, that's all it takes is a few minutes of practice every day and you'll be a superstar just like me and Zeus. Up. Good job! Good job, Zeusy! Yeah! That's the way! You're such a big boy! Yeah! It got especially filthy at the park today, so we're taking a paw bath. <laughs> Good morning, this is Jonathan from the Hart Memorial Library, and I am here with our special guest, author Candace Fleming. She is the author of more than 40 books. She writes books for children and young adults, and she wrote the Romanovs, she wrote the Lincolns, she wrote Muncha, 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 and she wrote the book we're talking about today, Strongheart. Thank you so much for coming and doing this interview with me. I'm glad to be here, it's happy. Yes, me too. So we really loved this book. And I know that you are particularly inspired by history. And this book is all about a silent movie star. Are you a fan of silent movies? You know, I wasn't until I began to do research for Strongheart. And then I discovered how um, really great silent movies are. And I, you know, I know we don't look at them the same way you know, people in the 1920s did, because I think they're really cheesy and over dramatic. Um, and, but, it, you know, they're great to watch. And, you know, I'm, I just, I, Strongheart has one movie that's left um, that we can actually see, and you can actually see it online. Um, it's called The Return of Boston Blackie. You can see it on YouTube. Um, and it's, I know it's a serious film, you know, about him chasing, um, robbers and that sort of thing but it's so over dramatic and overacted that there are places where i know i'm supposed to be really serious but my sons and i were just cracking up because it was just so funny so yeah they're great 
While doing your research, did you happen to like become enamored of any other silent movie stars? Um, you know, Charlie Chaplin was pretty great. I didn't watch, you know, Strongheart was his own star. So I have to admit that I didn't watch tons and tons of them. And I like, I watched Boston Blackie several times, I actually own it now. Um, and I know I actually went and bought it. Um, but um, Charlie Chaplin was really great. And there were these things called the Keystone Cops, which really were, um, um, they, they really were comedy. And these um, guys that were policemen and they always got into these real big pickles and then they had to get out of them. And and those are actually still, I think, really funny. I mean, they, they were meant to be funny and they still, you know, we were howling. We thought they were funny. So. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah. how long did it take you to research Strongheart? You know, Strongheart wasn't a book that I thought I was actually going to write. Um, I found the story, I was reading a book about Rin Tin Tin, an adult biography, it's actually called Rin Tin Tin. And um, in that book, Susan Orlean, who's the author of that book, um, has about a page and a half, I think, about Strongheart, where she said that Rin Tin Tin was actually uh, copy, I should call him a copy dog instead of a copy cat, I guess. It was copy dogging um, on the original Hollywood movie star dog, which was Strongheart. And I thought to myself, wow, I didn't never even heard of Strongheart. So I do what I always do, did what I always do. And I'm curious, I picked up my phone, right? Cause it's right next to me. And I Google Strongheart movie star dog page because we know how unreliable Wikipedia can be, um, but he didn't even have that. And so that made me even more curious to find out um, who he was. And also I gotta say just a little indignant because here was this, um, supposedly super famous dog in his time. Most Americans loved him. He was a box office smash. People knew who he was and we don't even remember him now. So um, I went and had to go and do some research. And since no one had written anything about him at that time that I was researching him, I actually went back to old movies, um, old movie magazines from the 20s. Um, in the 20s, they actually had magazines devoted just to the cinema because it was this brand new technology and Americans were crazy for it. So um, they had these great articles about Strongheart in Hollywood and Strongheart with Lady Jewel, their romance. And um, the New York Times had articles about Strongheart. Believe it or not, Strongheart went to the New York Times in 1924 and he gave an interview um, with the New York Times reporter. And he said, Baruf. So, and they actually said, it said B-R-R-R hyphen W-O-O-F. So every time I use Baruf in Strongheart, I'm actually using a direct quote from, from the New York Times, supposedly that's what they said. So, um, you know, it was, it was really primary research. You have to go back to those original sources that were created at the time that Strongheart was alive, which made it a lot like a detective project. Um, and it was a lot of fun. It was like following those clues, discovering the mystery, piecing together who the dog was. Um, and it took me, you know, probably about nine months to figure out enough to write a book. Um, I didn't research every day, obviously. I was doing something in my spare time, right? So interesting. So uh, was it hard to get into the headspace of a dog to write this book? I have a dog and I wish he was here. I was trying to coax him into my office this morning, but um, my husband, who is the illustrator of Strongheart, Eric Roman. Oh, I did yeah. not know that. Right. And that's why if that does the I have the arc here, the dedication page. Oh, it's not his picture. But if you open up your if you were to open up yours, um, I actually have a dedication to our dog Oxford, who's our strong heart. Um, and that's a picture of our dog Oxford, who is, there he is, um, for Oxford, our very own strong heart. And he's actually downstairs working with Eric in his studio today. So I couldn't convince him that he wanted to come upstairs. It's, it's nicer downstairs. He has a little fireplace. And, it's cozy down there. And they um, have a mind of their own, so. <laughs> they really do. So, but it was easy to get into, I think, Strongheart's head because I just uh, modeled them after Oxford, so. That's why it felt so personal. I love that. Mm -hmm. So there's a scene in Strongheart where he circles around on the bed with Larry and he can't, he keeps putting his, his back end in Larry's face and Larry's like, if you're going to sleep with me, you got to sleep head to head. And, and that is, and how he digs to make a little nest that is all Oxford 
They that that definitely song. rang very true. I feel like every dog owner has had that moment. <laughs> had that very moment. Yeah, where they rearrange everything and then they flop down and you go, got to be kidding. You're not going to sleep. <laughs> yeah, right? So, yeah. Is there anything from history that like a story that you're dying to tell, but you haven't found your way into that story yet? Mm, gosh, I have, you know, I always, um, I'm a story collector. So I'm always thinking about um, what would make a really great story. Um, you know, I've been playing around with this back in the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, um, and maybe it's because you know, we're all dealing with COVID and we're thinking about that new vaccine and, and um, all the things that are all in our heads right now. Um, but do you know, back in the late 50s and the early 60s, we actually vaccinated millions and millions and millions of people for polio, right? And we actually lined them up and they called them Sabin Sundays. The, um, the man who invented the, the polio vaccine that didn't require a shot, you could just drink it or take it on a sugar cube. Um, his name, uh, his last name was Sabin. And so on Sundays, all the way across the country, and I love this, it was like this holiday atmosphere. Um, towns had parties, right, on a Sunday. And in, on Sunday afternoons in the summer, they would come to, um, they opened up fire departments or high school gyms, and everybody would just line up and pop a sugar cube, right, or a or sometimes it was just a little pink stuff in a cup, but mostly it was just a sugar cube. And that was that was how they, that pretty easy inoculation, right? Um, but I loved the whole idea that the communities would get together. So they would make, kids would have poster contests and the local bakery would make cookies for everybody. And they'd have, um, you know, the Boy Scouts would sell or not even sell, the Boy Scouts would do like lemonade and, and, and the fire department would come out and they'd take people if they couldn't drive themselves or it was too far to walk, they'd come and pick people up. And I loved, I loved the idea of that, you know, the, the whole town coming together to do something like that. So maybe. Interesting. So uh, some people think like they see children's authors and they're like, oh, anybody could do that. But I feel like writing for children is something that is deceptively hard. Uh, so what can you say to people who think that writing for children is easier than writing for adults? You know, I think people think that um, it's easier to write for kids, I think, because they think kids are little, right? And so they don't know as much. And I think that's what, and, and in fact, um, I'm going to quote my friend Mo Willems here, who always says, kids aren't stupid, they're just short. And um, that's, that's, you know, really, and here it is. And uh, you can't fool child readers. That's why I think they're the best readers in the world. One, they're completely honest. If they don't like it, they don't like it. If it's boring, it's boring. Um, they will tell you flat out. But additionally, um, I think you have a real obligation to kids to get it right. Um, not just factually right, but to um, be, you know, we use this word morally and it sounds strange, like I'm being preachy, but but I think you have this idea to, to, to give them something as honest and as as real, truthful as you possibly can. Um, and since it's the first time they may encounter a subject that you're you're writing about, I think you have to be particularly careful and particularly clear. Um, I'm sure you've had this experience. You think about books that you read when you were a kid and you totally, totally believed it. And then you discover that that writer you know, I'm thinking about biographies that I read when I was a kid um, and they were completely fictionalized. And so who I thought like Claire Barton was, was not who Claire Barton actually was. And I would, but for a while I didn't even like biographies as a kid because I thought they were all um, not true, but you know, I've come around, I guess. So. Interesting. Yeah, I think you're right. I feel like some people think they have to write down to children uh, and then yeah. kids are, super tough critics because if i'm reading something and my kid doesn't like it he will straight up say it's boring and we have to yeah. stop yeah exactly and they're perceptive and they're um um sensitive and um the other thing that they're why they're i think they're the best readers is that um they go into the book they actually like they almost like crawl into a book, right? And so they find connections to their own lives and their own worlds that sometimes, well, all, all the time, surprise me. So they'll make some connection to a book and I go, I've never thought about that. And that is, and it's genius, you know? Um, but yeah, yeah. What were some of your childhood favorites? 
Oh, I love Mr. Popper's Penguins. That was my number one favorite. And my all time favorite book that I encountered, I think I was about nine when I got this book was um, Sylvester and the Magic Pebble um, by William Steig. And it is still my favorite book of all time. Seriously, all time. And I think it's, I can't figure out why it works because it's, um, it breaks what every rule that a writer is told they shouldn't do. Your main character should always be active and centered to the story. But Sylvester turns into a rock on Strawberry Hill on page four, and he just sits there through the whole. <laughs> he sits there through the whole book, but it's still so great, and it's funny, and it's heartwarming, and it has this end that catches me every single time. Um, and it's just, and there's an author who never talked down to his readers. When you look at the sophistication of his language and, and um, sentence structure, William Steig, uh, he really knew what he was doing. And he obviously was having fun doing it. So. Absolutely. And I feel like you have that sense in your book too, where uh, at times I forgot that I was reading a children's book. Uh, and not that the story wouldn't appeal to them, just that some authors, it seems like they want to patronize them. And you didn't do that in this book. And I love that. Right. And I think kids love language anyway. I think they really, I know they do. You know, I mean, how many times, I think about this time I went and saw a group of, and they must've been preschoolers. And we, I used the word bouquet and he didn't know, one of the boys didn't know what the word was. And I told him what it was. And then he said, say it again. And so I said, bouquet. And he actually leaped to his feet and was like, I love this. It was the best, one of the best moments I've ever had as a writer. He leaped to his feet and he went, bouquet, bouquet. I mean, he could just completely feel the, the, the beauty of that word. And I thought, oh, this is, this is, a, this is, see, adult readers would never leap to their feet and go, bouquet right but child readers were so yeah they're the best readers in the world absolutely i agree i read that yeah, as a child uh like you had a reputation among your peers as being a fibber and your parents regarded it as you being very imaginative uh can you talk about that yes yeah um when i was a kid before i, I mean i've always been a writer um and i've you know, I filled up papers since I was able to write, but there was a long period of time. And I'm, you know, where, what was in my head was not, I was not able to get onto a piece of paper. So the words would go really fast in my head, but I can't still trying to wrestle with how to spell, you know, cat. And so I would tell people stories. And I learned early on that if you told them with um, um, a lot of detail and you told them with, um, a lot of confidence that people would believe them. And it was not only would they believe them if they'd ask for more. So in kindergarten, I actually had a series of stories that I called Candy and um, the Adventures of Candy and Spot. And Spot, I told my friends was my three-legged cat. And we had all kinds of fun adventures with bears and tigers and snakes in the woods behind my house. I lived in Chicago. Um, so there were no bears, tigers, or snakes or woods in my backyard. But, you know, I told it with great confidence. I also didn't have a three-legged cat. In fact, I didn't have uh, a cat at all. Um, but my friends would actually believe it. And they would come over. I remember having them come over, uh, Mike, this Mike Phillips was his name. He came over, he wanted to meet my cat spot and I didn't have a cat spot. And so then I tried to sell him on the fact that the cat was an invisible three-legged cat, but even he, <laughs> but even he didn't quite buy that one. Um, but, but once I started to be able to put those stories down and the thing was, you know, some people would go, oh, you're a big fibber, right? That would be a really bad thing. But here's the deal. I told stories, but I didn't tell stories. So like, you know, I remember one time in first grade, I tripped this boy. I did it intentionally. I put my foot out. Not know why. But he fell down and um, hurt himself. Um, not a proud moment. Now, I could have told the teacher I didn't do it, but I was perfectly, you know, I completely admitted it. So I wasn't that sort of fibber, but I did like to tell a good story. Um, and so luckily for me, I had parents and teachers that instead of squashing my storytelling um, impulses, actually encouraged them. And so instead of calling me a fibber, they called me a storyteller, but they also encouraged me to write them down. So I kept a lot of notebooks when I was a kid. In fact, I brought one with me just in case nobody believes me. I always have to have, you have to prove up, right? Um, so here's my fifth grade writing notebook. Um, yeah, it's a giraffe. Um, 
you can't tell because it's fallen apart is so old. I mean, think about how old it was. You know, it's been a long time since I was in fifth grade, right? But if you open up my notebook and it's falling apart, so hard to open it. But if you open it up, you'll just see stories that I wrote for me for fun. Wow. Just because. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Good thing I had this awesome. mom that was a real, real pack rat, right? Keeps, keeps everything. So, yeah. Amazing. So, and my first, my first writing award, I won in fifth grade. Here it is. It was the first place blue ribbon, but it's so old. It's now my first place purple ribbon, but um, I still keep it close to me here on my big computer um, because even though I've won a lot of awards since then, that's my favorite one because it reminds me that the reason I do this is just because it's a lot of fun. And yeah, I've been doing it a long time. talisman for your writing too. That's wonderful. It is a really, I never thought of that. I love that word. You're right. It is a talisman really. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for making time for us. And thank you so much for writing such wonderful books for children. We look forward to the wonderful stories from history that you're going to interest to introduce us to next and some more of your wonderful picture books. And thank you so much for making time for us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. It was fun. Hi, everybody. If you're reading this book, you probably love dogs as much as I do. And today I'm going to show you how to make a special treat for your dog. I'm going to show you how to make homemade peanut butter and banana dog ice cream. It's very easy to do and you only need a few ingredients. So you are gonna need a blender. You're going to need four bananas. I peeled them and I cut them. You're going to need a 32 ounce container of non-fat vanilla yogurt. And you're gonna need one cup of peanut butter. You're also going to need some ice cube trays to pour it in. And of course a spoon or a knife, something to help you mix. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my 32 ounce container of vanilla yogurt and I'm going to pour it into my blender. Now I'm not quite sure if all of this is going to fit into my blender or not, but keep our fingers crossed we don't make too much of a mess. All right, now I am going to take my bananas. I have chopped up three cups, not three cups of bananas, three of the bananas. You wanna make sure they're peeled, like I said, and chopped. So I'm taking that fourth one, showing you what I'm gonna do. Um, if you have any of those black spots on your bananas, you can just cut that part out. And you want these bananas to be pretty ripe. All right, oh, like this, look at this. This banana part's kind of yucky. So I'm going to cut off that part, throw the rest in the garbage. And then I'm going to take my one cup of peanut butter. And what's important about this peanut butter is that you make sure that it doesn't have an ingredient called xylitol. X I, no, X Y L I T O L. That is very dangerous and can be fatal to dogs. So you want to make sure that your peanut butter, it doesn't have to be organic peanut butter, but it does have to be peanut butter that does not contain that. And when I did some research, there were about five different peanut butter products that contained it. None of the ones that were the mainstream type peanut butter. So just make sure that you don't get peanut butter with xylitol. We don't want any puppies to be hurt on this. I'm now going to take this all like this and I'm going to put it in my blender. Now, hold the top. It's pretty full. I'm gonna turn it on and I'm gonna start by mixing it. It's gonna get loud. Okay, doesn't look like anything happened. So I'm gonna try a little higher. Let's do food processor. Now fast forward a few minutes after I finished mixing and you'll see that my mixture has turned into something that looks almost like a peanut butter shake. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take and get my ice cube trays. And what I have here is a regular ice cube tray. And here I have a smaller ice cube tray because I have little dogs. And with this full recipe, this might take four to six ice cube trays. All right, and I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna pour it into my ice cube tray. Now, it's kind of heavy, look. Oh, it's gonna be messy. Oh, it is awful messy. Oh, there was a whole chunk of banana there. All right, and once I finish pouring it into my ice cube tray, what I can do is I can take a spoon, I can shake it first. I can take a spoon and I can take it and push it into the ice cube parts. What might be easier might be to just take my spoon 
and mix it after I finish mixing it and put it into the ice cube tray. All right, something similar to like this, where I might take it and I might put it in one or two or three or all of them, <laughs> all of the different parts of my ice cube tray. Now, I'm gonna keep doing this, but I wanna tell you one more thing. You wanna make sure, like I said, that when this is all mixed up, you're then gonna take it and put it in the freezer for a few hours. Once it's frozen, you're gonna take it out and you're going to be able to give it to your dog. And the nice thing about this treat is that it is homemade, so there are no added chemicals to keep it fresh. And I think it contains ingredients that your dog will love. So I'm gonna take it right now, I'm gonna put it into the freezer, and then I'll fast forward again, and you'll be able to see if dogs really like this yummy homemade treat of banana peanut butter ice cream. I'll be back in a few. So here is the real test. This is my puppy Giuseppe. The ice cream has frozen and you can see he loves it. It is delicious, isn't it Giuseppe? Giuseppe, what do you think? I don't know mama, I give it two paws up. Good job Giuseppe, now get off my couch with that ice cream. I hope everyone had as much fun making it as I did. See you soon. Hi, thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the book Strongheart. Be sure to join us in two weeks on April 1st, no fooling, at 6 p.m. as we discuss the book, The Unicorn in the Barn. Really, seriously, no fooling. So until next time, so long and happy reading.